welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's me, Jack, Jackie. Is that like fun? Do you like plan those ahead of time, Jackie? Like the extra sounds or you just kind of whatever comes to you? Whatever comes to me. Nope. Actually, I've set myself up with some goals to make myself more, to make my language more variable each time that we do this podcast we're like a lag schedule of Mm -hmm. i'm hoping that you crazy intros you all recognize it right because i can't reinforce myself so that's true need Mm -hmm. to put those contingencies in place it's a lag one okay so it just (laughs) needs to be different than the last time yep (laughs) okay okay and it was because jackie hasn't been for a couple years (laughs) it's yeah that's true (laughs) Welcome, welcome to our podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, where every week we discuss a topic in the field and the relevant research behind it. And this week, as Jackie mentioned, we're all about goal setting, but not kicking goals in soccer or basketball. They don't call it a goal in basketball. Football? It's a hooper. It's a dunker. It's a dunker. Football? Goal? Yeah. Yes. You could have a goal in football. We're talking about goals, like personal goals. Work goals. Goals. Life goals. The things that you set. Hashtag for life goals. Hashtag. So we will be talking all about what are goals? How do goals work or not? How can you use goals with other forms of performance management kind of technologies to either improve or make no difference to the overall rates and (laughs) diana gave me a hot take earlier today where she's like i don't buy any of this research she seems kind of negative on goals Uh i've been setting goals all week and then my mic cable didn't work when we started this and even though i'd met all my goals i'm still in a terrible mood so goals don't make magic happen but (laughs) do they change behavior on a bigger scale for say like a direct service company or a home depot or a papa gino's or Busy restaurants, <laughs> a gap, right? We think we're a banana everything. republic. Yeah, let's just list stores now. <laughs> Old Navy. We'll get People the whole might want to know why Barnes and You're Noble. All these random stores. Why we're naming random stores? Mm-hmm. Oh, People should... might want to know why. Because we're talking about goal setting. And what are the articles? That's what she's trying to pull you in. Uh, <laughs> Your, your question is a bit of a non sequitur. They might want to know why you're naming stores. Because <laughs> like, we're, we're talking about goal setting. That's why. Would you like to know the articles, Diana? Yeah. Are you champing at the bit about it? Yep. Okay. Have you have you been hoist by your own petard? No, I hate that phrase. <laughs> I don't know any of these phrases, so Robert no, no. says it to annoy me. Oh. Fair. <laughs> that's a good that's a Shakespearean term. Okay. What are the articles, Rob? I'll tell you the articles. They are an evaluation of the effects of very difficult goals by Roos and Williams from the Organiz- Journal of Organizational Behavior Management, 2018. Oh, I was wrong. You were wrong. I thought 2017. I got the early release in 2017. Oh, yeah. JK. Your friends, Dr. Bruce, sent it to you. A Behavioral Analysis of Goal Setting by Feldner and Solzer Azaroff from the Journal of Organizational Behavior Management, 1984. I was four years old when that <laughs> was read. a good year. The, uh, it's like that book. Was it a good book? It was a good the happy, Orwell, 1984. Happy ending? Was it, yeah. was it as much fun as that Animal Farm, like in Babe? <laughs> a pig pig in up. the City? Yeah. I'm going to rewrite Animal Farm just to be Babe, Pig in the City. <laughs> the Effects of Graphic Feedback, Goal Setting, and Manager Praise on Customer Service Behaviors by Louie and Bailey. Also from the Journal of Organizational Behavior Management. It's a heavy hitter in this episode. Sorry, I went for, the, I went for it. <laughs> oh, here's one also from the Journal of Organizational Behavior Management. <laughs> called Using Task Clarification, Goal Setting, and Feedback to Decrease Table Bussing Times in a Franchise Pizza Restaurant. You know it's Pizza Hut. <laughs> yeah, it totally, it totally had Pizza Hut vibes. It did. It's like, you get your all-you-can-eat book. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Good coin. Yeah. Do I get my Land Before Time hand puppets? <laughs> I still have those. those I, I wanted those so bad. Who wrote this article about hand, Land Before Time hand puppets? Why Amigo, Smith, and Ludwig, 2008. <laughs> Spoiler, they do not mention the puppets. That's funny. And you know the journal, 2016, (laughs) graphic feedback, performance feedback, and goal setting increased staff compliance with the data collection task at a large residential facility by Gill and Carter. And we don't need to discuss that article because the results are in the title. I love that. Thank you, Gill and Carter. 
So this was my topic of choice, and we are getting around January, right? Not there yet, though. Not here yet. So this is the time to start thinking about goals for January so that you can set a goal or an intention for the new year. Oh, I thought you just meant about you getting to go first. Oh, no, 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 no. (laughs) That's awesome. I was like, I know, I know. (laughs) But that's my goal. But no, right? So when I was like, okay, it was my time to pick a topic. And I've been thinking a lot about my own personal goals in life, which is like real deep, right? Like, where do you go from here? (laughs) And I was like, I wonder what behavior analysis has to say about that. And so I found these articles. They're also in one of the classes that I'm teaching. And so I was really excited to present this, right, as a precursor to everyone's January 1st goals. That's smart. New Year's. Mm. And how you can do it so that then you'll be successful, right? Because we all know that sometimes those January resolutions turn into February non solutions. Mm. <laughs> it's a good term. Yeah, I made it up. What? But also, why put off until tomorrow what you can do today? Right. You don't have to wait until January. That's true. You have a goal you want to start working on, get on it. Right. I don't. You don't have any I'm goal? Content. I love that about you. Yeah, I just ate a lot of cookies and that might have an impact. Right. They do say there's lots of extraneous variables (laughs) that can affect goal goal achievement. I'm going to actually start off this this one by talking about the Fellner and Azeroth review. There's nothing better than a good review written in the Mm. 80s. (laughs) Right, like a warm blanket. It is like a warm blanket. So they start off by talking about all the research that has been conducted outside of the field of ABA. So they talk about how, you know, goal setting research has been around forever. They said, you know, one of the first known goal setting research was from 1897. Oh. When it's looking at improving telegraphers behaviors. I wonder what kind I of wish I thought that was a setting. typo. 1890s. I was like, there's no way there was a research article that wasn't about like electricity. Or- I so a different podcast I was listening to was just sure. talking about the telegraph. Oh. And said that. When Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, it took... Wait, what? I, I know, right? It took a, until a ship brought the news to England, oh, wow. right? So it took several weeks. And then not that long afterwards, mm, I think it was Chester A. Arthur was not killed, but an assassination attempt. And they got the news to London overnight. Because at that point, they had telegraph wires under the ocean. And it was only like 20 years later. Wow. So goal setting research. The details on that, it might be a little bit fuzzy. If Mm. anyone needs to spot check it, feel free. Well, you might ask yourself, what is goal setting, right? What is the telegraph? What is the telegraph? (laughs) Sorry. Now I'm taking on a horrible tangent. (laughs) Just kidding. So these authors describe goal setting as defined as specifying the level of performance that an individual or a group should work to. So they don't suggest a time requirement. However, in later research, they suggest that potentially having a time requirement might make it more objective and more salient. So Mm -hmm. just putting it out there since this was done in the 80s. So previous research in the 80s really focused on different aspects of goals and what makes them effective. But the common feature of the goal setting literature outside of ABA is that there is this common cognitive mediating factor, right? So we need to have the internal motivation and drive in order to achieve our goals. Hmm. Let me file that away in my mind file. In your mind files, right? And I'll so file under a G for gold. <laughs> and gold. Just kidding. <laughs> oh no, I mixed them up. I guess the main researcher on goal setting was a man named Locke, and he conceptualized goals as the relation between an intention and then the task performance. And he specifically wrote there was no place for behavior analysis in the account of goal setting. Yeah, I I couldn't tell if the articles were trying to make him seem like a real dumb, dumb dummy. Because then they would sort of be like, he said all these things. And then he said this like a jerk. But then they kind of complimented his work again. So I I do feel like it was an even handed, even though it's kind of nasty to uh, behavior. It seems like he had a very different viewpoint, right? So he said that when behaviorists came in. In the 1960s, when it's, that started to be more of a mainstream viewpoint, that it ruined psychology <laughs> as a whole, right? So, but I think some of his articles and what he did, we can reconceptualize them through a behavior analytic lens without using the cognition mediation. And I think that's where they're 
we don't really need that part to reconceptualize what he did because we, we can don't. S- yeah, because <laughs> no. we can see it, right? But he didn't. So I think he did some work. Where- it looked like he did some work with Glenn Latham too. I was looking at looking through the references because I saw I saw I think it was Locke and Latham, or it mm. might have been another researcher, but it was in the, in those sort of like somewhat anti behavior analytic terms. I was like, our buddy Glenn. The power of positive parenting. I hope it's not him. Maybe we got he got there right. Like everybody starts in a different Maybe. place. They end in a different place. He was a young grad student. He didn't right. know any better. Yeah, Glenn. So, no. Generally, more specific goals are better than the do your best goals, and harder goals are better than easy goals. And what they said is, as of 2006, over a thousand studies have looked at goal setting outside of the field of behavior analysis. And then I like the art. the The authors very like specifically say you know this review is going to demonstrate that goal setting can be conceptualized without the use of cognitive media she's like no no lock no no (laughs) and she's like do you know goals can be conceptualized in two ways right they can be just stimuli that precede behavior so when an antecedent goal is reliably paired with a reinforced response then it can become a discriminative stimulus right that that goal is now going to set the occasion for that behavior to occur and be reinforced in the future under similar conditions. And then once you have many goals that are attained because you're killing it, Mm -hmm. then goals can serve as the reinforcing stimulus or attaining those goals, right? So then the goal can now serve as a condition reinforcer. I love that the example they gave was like of a paper mill. Mm -hmm. So you can tell that that's dated. It's like, we, we used our our graph paper and drew a graph and drew a line where everyone needed to, you know, make make mm. their paper products. <laughs> we improved the sales that. of cruise ships at our at our travel agency. Right? That's a real 80s endeavor. Yeah, and so then they and then they were like, "Yeah, when we made these goals, people made them and it was really great and we reinforced those behaviors." But they were clear to state that goals are not inherently or well, they will not always act as SDs or reinforcers. Right. Because we need to look at what's happening between the relation of the goal to the behavior and the environment. Right. So if goals are not met with reinforcement ever or are not achievable, you're probably not going to see the change in behavior that you want to see or you it might be counterintuitive. Right. Or counterproductive. Yep. Right. People will just be like, oh, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm out like that in pure. You just know, like that. Ted fashion. Yeah. Other researchers later on have conceptualized goals as rule governed behavior. I love it when people have an argument with themselves in a paper. They're like, <laughs> you know, rules can be linked to rule governed behavior because the rule, I mean, the goal could be a rule, right, without the contingency, but the contingency might be there. So then it wouldn't really be rule governed behavior. It might be an EO that sets yeah. the occasion mm-hmm. for the behavior to occur. So it could be either of those things. It's like every OBM article. Like, what are the what are the underlying mechanisms of this phenomenon that we just studied? And we we know it worked because we have a graph. But why? It could be this. It could be reinforcement. We don't it could know, be right? an SD. It could be a rule. It could be an EO. And you, you're right. It's we don't it's hard to kind of tease that out. And and honestly, the average person probably doesn't, doesn't care. Doesn't care, right? But I love I love that they talked about it. And the, I like their conceptualization of goals as establishing yeah. operations, right? Because it's not that the reinforcer wasn't always there because mm-hmm. it could always have been there, right? But it, now the reinforcer is more valuable, right? And so it's it's increasing the value of the reinforcer and increasing the behavior altering effect mm-hmm. of whatever, you know, that goal was. So I, I want to like get some of these articles and give them to some of my supervisees who are, you know, just finishing up grad school and be like, these are great examples of how you can use, you know, your precise behavior analytic language to discuss more like weirdly conceptual targets. And then you'll never do it again because nobody wants to hear you do this outside of other behavior analysts. <laughs> but when one thing I really love about these articles in particular, right, uh, uh, putting aside this review, is that they tried to tackle a real world problem, right? Yes. It wasn't like, oh, I have this translational research. They're like, I'm in a busy pizza shop. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I need people to look. I'm at a large residential setting. So I think when we look at these studies, we also have to think about the setting in which they're happening in. Right. There's going to be a lot more variables that are at play than if we were doing it, say, in the laboratory or something, which is one of the studies that I'll talk about and how we saw a little bit of a different result. Goals may also serve as an S delta. Right. If they're impossible to achieve and not specific. 
You see this yeah. a lot with competitive companies in ABA, like you have to hit like a certain like if you get 37 billable hours, you'll get a raise. And everyone's like, I have never heard of anyone right. mm-hmm. that gets those 37 billable hours. Right. So in that in that instance, that goal is not achievable. So it actually sets it up for non-responding. Right. So you're not going to be responding in that. Can I tell you my favorite goal that I've ever received yeah. in work? So yes. when I was before I went to college, I worked at Funko Land, which b- b- was bought by GameStop. It's a video. Okay. Game, it's a video Sounds game like store. It's going to be an amusement park. It, it is not. Like, Ooh, I'm it going. Is, it, is a, it is a video game store. It's one of the first places that would buy people's video games and then and we'd sell them at a profit to the company and not at that great a price for the average consumer. But in any case, we it was you know it's New England. Those places are always like that. Yeah, but it's New England, and there was like a blizzard, and me and my buddy we called him Camp Kenny. And we were, we were there and I was assistant manager, so I had to be there. And it was like so snowy, but they didn't like close things. It was just like, no one's out. It's like terribly snowy and they haven't plowed yet, but we're stuck in our store because we'd started there earlier. And all of a sudden we get this fax of like, Hey, if you can sell, it was a fax. This was, (laughs) this was the late, this is the late nineties. We got a fax saying, if you can sell on your black, this percentage of, I forget, whatever, 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 whatever the goal was to sell, then you'll get a free lunch. And Camp Candy and I look at each other and we go, this is ridiculous. It's a freaking blizzard. We're not going to sell anything and we almost did it though we were one shy because people are just sort of like some sort of like weird adventure they just sort of oh, come yeah. in occasionally that's so funny you almost did it though we almost did it and then we went to the pizza hut that was next door and we bought a pizza and we ate it on a table of nintendo 64s it was really fun <laughs> huh good times did you have to bust your own table or <laughs> we just we just put the Bring it nintendo out. 64s back <laughs> but but surprisingly even though we were like this is a stupid goal this is an impossible goal we did actually really yeah. try to reach the goal, and we came pretty close. And so, I think back on it as a happy memory, other than a, what a stupid corporate decision to send us this thing. They're not paying attention to the weather. They don't care about their workers, which is all true. But the goal <laughs> right. was effective. No, almost effective. Well, Hey, we were trying to sell things. We could have easily been like, it's a blizzard. We're not going to try anything. I'm going to go take a nap in the back room. No one's in the store. That's true. So when you're talking about that, right, they were specific. So... Ultimately, research has looked at that goals should be objective, they should be specific, so that the achievement is reliably reinforced and the supervisor knows what they're reinforcing and the supervised needs know what to do in order to receive reinforcement. Feedback's really important overall. What they say in this review, we'll talk about it in terms of your research articles to maintain or strengthen behavior. And they talk about participative goal setting is way more beneficial than if someone was going to assign you a goal. And that makes sense, right? I love because that word. Me too. Participative. Participative. I, I, read that, I read that as those results were a little more mixed. Like if you have the choice, pers- participative is usually better, yeah. but there might be times that it is not, is not the, not the ideal choice. I, I usually choose that. Yeah. Because choice is an illusion anyway, right? And you see more usually responding when people choose. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, according to these articles, it was more mixed. I love that they ended this review by saying using behavior analysis is perfect because we collect data, we change behavior, (laughs) we demonstrate a functional relation so we can show that goal setting is or is not effective. The fix is in on that. that, uh, We're perfect. (laughs) Thank you very much. And so one thing is that Locke and his colleagues in 2006, when they like rounded up after that original review of goal setting with Felsner and Schultz. Surloff as I'm not looking at it, so I had to just remember it. Is that as you know, Locke still says in 2006, as long as one is committed to their goals, they have the skills to attain the goal, and they don't have a conflicting goal, they should be able to do it. There's this positive linear relationship, right? And so we're like, maybe not, right? And so in the Roos and Williams article, they actually give a really good overview on the types of research that people might do when they're looking at goals so they'll they look at goal commitment they look at difficult goals and they look at the quality of work Mm -hmm. surrounding goals i thought it was important to talk about all these now so that then we can use them as a you know a reference when we go Mm -hmm. over our articles perfect so goal commitment suggests that there's this internal motivation it's the most important thing that's what Locke thinks. It's filed under M for motivation motivation and the question that you ask yourself or ask your participants is how committed are you to this goal? Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so according to Locke, you have to ask that and they'll answer. We all know verbal report isn't the most accurate always. But, but it could be verbal report as public posting. 
sure, but it's not always the most accurate. No, like, oh, no, 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 no. In, that's what yes, I'm saying, no, right? Yes. I'm not, I'm not, I can be like, I'm very committed to this goal and then eat a chocolate cake, mm-hmm. this, right? I can be committed verbally in my language, but my behavior might not. Matter. But if you said it at like a conference, like everybody, I've been teaching about this and I'm going to never eat a chocolate cake. Then I probably would hide it right in the back because I'm never. You not. might. Okay. You, you might. You might. <laughs> right? But how the author suggests this is that behavior analysis can account this through the four term contingency, right? We're looking at that, that, that overarching, motivating, evocative or abative effect of what's happening. And one other research suggests that there's a negative relation between goals that you've rejected and how committed one is to goal. That makes sense, mm-hmm. right? If you're like, I'm not going to do this goal, obviously you're not going to be committed to the goal. So it does make sense. Right. That's I true. was like, wow, you had to write that. But OK, that's that's fine. Yeah. And what they found in articles outside of the behavior analytic literature is that you may be more likely to reject a very difficult goal goal. But if you accept that difficult goal, you're more likely to work harder to achieve it. So I thought that was interesting. I'm not sure how we would conceptualize that. But we do try in the Roos and Williams article. And then other articles look at difficult goals, right? So Locke and his colleagues recommends making difficult goals and making what they call stretch goals. So difficult goals are goals that 10% of the people may achieve if they were doing it. That's kind of hard, right, for us. And a stretch goal is a goal that's less than 10% of people over the time would achieve. And here, there's an issue with like those definitions, right? Behavior analytically. And also an issue of the definition of attainable or unattainable when Mm. we're talking about making goals, right? Because we all know that at any one given time, there'll be so many variables at play that will make the goal more or less likely, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't eaten. I haven't slept. I'm like... And it's hard All to measure things, attainability right? until you have or have not attained right. the goal. <laughs> right. So I could be working toward it. But yeah. So, you know, they found that not all the participants even tried the very difficult goal or they did it once and gave up quickly. Mm-hmm. That's an issue with motivation or performance. We don't know. It's something that we should teach out. And the business literature suggests that stretch goals should be provided to employees, but they underrepresented that stretch goals were counterproductive and ineffective in the literature. Mm-hmm. So they're like, do this, but don't look at the literature because right. they're not looking good. I think that was a big part of uh, bringing out the best in people. Yeah, they talk right? about stretch goals, which I, I always think of as like the goals where they're like, good job, you did it. Now here's a new goal immediately. But th- this definition, I think, was, was, was more in line with, yeah. with what Daniel's talked about in that book. I think so, too. Yeah. Oh, bringing it into other episodes. That was a long time ago we read that book. I know. And then the only other two thing they talk about is quality of work. So looking at if you make a very difficult goal, does the performance drop, right? Because the goal is so difficult. Or do you see it leading to unethical behavior or, you know, coercive behavior in Mm. the workplace to achieve that goal? And I could see that happening, right? Mm. Like slashing people's tires so they don't get to a home on time because they're close to those billable hours. Or think about Monsters, Inc., in the beginning, right when that guy tries to steal the baby. Oh, Randall! Yeah, they're they're trying to. Right, he's trying to. He's yes. trying to like. Sully's going to be the top screamer. Well, I, well, I, I, I don't know. Have you seen that movie in a while, Jaggy? No, I don't want to spoil it for the audience. Okay. But even though it looks like he might, you know, Randall the monster might be engaging in unethical scream stealing behavior to become sure. the top screamer, the top scarer. Yeah, there, there's a twist. There's a little bit more nefarious. I haven't seen it. Goings on. Okay. Well, maybe it's not the best. Uh, Let me tell you right all now. about Monsters Inc. <laughs> and I think their feedback systems and goal setting, not so great. Well, that's okay. There was a whole TV show about it on Disney Plus. Oh, that's so funny. Not sponsoring our show, but. Okay. And then they said when it gets too difficult, it usually changes to more of a negative reinforcement paradigm because you're just trying to get out of whatever's aversive, right? And then. Finally, in my study, we looked at, or I didn't do it with, <laughs> in my study, Bruce and Williams and me, my just study. kidding, looked at persistence and whether or not be, goals will persist in the absence of reinforcement. So that's kind of like the crux of all of the main concepts that we're going to hit on today in these, in these lovely articles that we're going to read. Great. Well, now that we have a nice overview of goal setting. I don't think I've ever talked that long, by the way. Like nice. in a chunk of time? Yeah. I don't know. I can't think of any. (laughs) I'm going to pick topics in the future and then give myself the review. I always like the review. It's a good good summary. It's a good way to start a show. So, 
Let's take a little break. When we come back, we're going to talk about goal setting in action. Don't go away. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking about goal setting in the context of improving performance. But before we do that, I'm going to set a goal to remind you that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to the show, you're able to earn one learning credit. All you need to do is listen to the show and then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash getceus. That's G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S. And then enter in some information, including two secret code words that we've placed in this episode. The first one of those is FAN, F-A-N, FAN. It's either the mechanical or handheld object that you wave in front of your face to cool yourself off could be somebody who really, really enjoys some team or movie or musical performer. Fan. Could be that movie. I think those are called stands now. No, what no, stand is when you like love something. Like Stan, like, but like way too much love it. Like Stan from the Eminem song of the same name. Is that what it's what it means? I believe that is where it came from, but I have not looked it up. I'm just going to assume it. I also don't understand why people use that term rather than I love, which seems to have the exact (laughs) same connotation. Okay. Young listeners, write in. (laughs) Let us know. We're old. We're old. We don't understand these new words. But I do know fan. But I do know fan because those have been around for hundreds of years. (laughs) Just like us. Fan. (laughs) All right. So now we talked about goal setting. We've talked about what it is or could be. We've talked about some general ways it's been measured and used in research in the past. Let's actually talk about goal setting and action in research papers. I will be talking about Gill and Carter 2016 article in which goal setting was a component of proving performance in, again, a place that I think many of our listeners will know, a human service setting, a residential home or a series of residential homes where direct care staff are expected to do tons and tons of things. And we all know that when we have direct care staff who complete lots of tasks, have positive attitudes, it can really improve the quality of life of the residents and of the clients there. We also know that the more individuals are trained and consistently follow data collection procedures, the better clinical decisions we're able to make using that data to, again, improve uh, the lives or at least work to support the improvements or the acquisition skill acquisition of our residents, of our clients. Now, in settings like this, we typically have a lot of different sort of organizational behavior management techniques being used. Some common antecedent ones would be, say, just clarifying tasks, goal setting, huh? That's one we'll be talking a little bit more about, as well as things like visual prompting in the form of rule posting. Here's how you're supposed to do do these activities. And then in-servicing, which I think they just meant in-service trainings, but I've never heard it expressed as in servicing. I've never I've never heard that as a as a verb. Like I'm in servicing my staff today. It sounds bad. Perhaps it's something else, but I, did I didn't they use the word shill. No, they right? did not. <laughs> Throw learning, back. Learning them all. You also have your consequent interventions like, you know, verbal graphic feedback, which again, we've done a whole we've done episodes about feedback, episodes upon episodes of feedback. We know feedback's also successful at improving behavior. 
But also uh, complex, and we don't really understand how it necessarily You know what? Either. Name anything from OBM Research, and it works. Why does it work? Oh, a lot of reasons it could work. It's very complex. There are a lot of other... Uh, there, are lo- there are a lot of issues that could come into its effectiveness or non-effectiveness. But it almost very always young works. field. Yes. It's as old as the 80s. Actually, no. No, it's a super old field. When was that article? 1879? That wasn't in our field, though. Well, it was in the field of... Psychology. In- and the questions <laughs> that we want answered in OBM... Similar. Very... Very different. Very, yeah. That's true. All it right, fine. Nascent years. Okay, too. okay. That's enough of that. <laughs> too much vocabulary. It's not a code word time. So the purpose of this article was to use graphic feedback as part of a package intervention. So they really focused on the, gra- <laughs> the graphic feedback, even though we're talking about goal setting, as part of a package intervention to improve group performance related to data collection procedures, specifically and this is another piece that I'm, I'm going to have a little bone to pick with some OBM research. Just the submission of data collection cards. And spoiler alert, they mentioned it as a limitation. They didn't actually look at whether anyone was taking data correctly. They just had to hand in the cards. You know what? That's what they were looking for. So no, it's, 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 it's step one. It's fine as a goal. Well, yeah, it'd be step one, except do you know how long this research took to complete? Two years. I actually two do know. <laughs> years. If you hard. told me we've been working really hard and it took us two years. But we've got over 80% of people handing in their data sheets. That means that nobody was handing in the data sheets. So even mm. if they were taking data correctly, they weren't turning it in. So that's step one, man. Maybe maybe, maybe it's me, but I feel like when you tell me it took two years to have people hand things in, I still feel like, that's too long. There's not enough time on the human scale. Wow. I also feel like you might have complete turnover in your staff in two years. Oh, yeah. They mentioned, they mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the limitations. <laughs> Sorry they mentioned that. Ahead. Well, it has nothing to do with the, you know, the overall procedure, I suppose. And the other goal was, we're not going to use money, no monetary incentives to be used. So it was really just, we're going to use this package that has graphic feedback, it has performance feed, we we deliver performance feedback, and we set goals. So the facility itself, and again, this is probably one of the reasons it took two years, is we're talking about 200 residents with intellectual disabilities, 13 different homes, and 12 in the final analysis, because one was not able to continue. And we had all of the employees, so 200 total shafts, 200 total staff across like a morning, an afternoon, and an evening shift. So we're talking about lots and lots of people in the study. And like I said, the dependent variable was compliance with turning in a permanent product data card at the end of the shift. So just handing it in. They also collected in, collected sign-in sheets from folks, but that was more just to keep track of how many people worked so that they could come up with that final kind of percentage of individuals who handed in their cards. So the data cards were pretty simple. I mean, they had some nifty little cards. They had, you know, coded systems. One side of the card was like a three by five card, had data for skill acquisition. The other had data for uh, problem behavior decreasing. And they would stick it between their lanyard, which I love. Actually, my favorite takeaway from this article was I'm going to start having people with their data sheets in their little name badge card so that they can always have it with them. And they don't have to wear, oh, I didn't bring my clipboard. Oh, it's too hard to carry. It's in your name badge card. It's right there. Mm -hmm. So if you learn anything from this episode, it's put your data sheet in your name badge card. If you can fit it. If you can fold it up. Like a little little origami data sheet. (laughs) And it also was coded with lots of little code. I, I, just, I just really love the data system. That actually was my favorite part of this article mm-hmm. was a little data system that they had. And then, like I said, the sign-in sheet just to track who was working that shift. You know, if you picked up a new shift, they could, they could still kind of factor you in. And they'd calculate the percentage of compliance with handing in those data sheets. They look at it over about two weeks as well. So, you know, it was multiple baseline design. They had kind of an ABC design as well. And in baseline, it was just hand in your data sheets whenever you hand in your data sheets and they use that information to feel like it if you do it do it great and they use that information to sort of set up different groups like high performing group the medium performing group and the low performing group which i think when we talk about goals and the effectiveness of certain goals versus other goals it does seem to be important to know who are your high performers low performers in terms of which kinds of goals do you use if you want to see success with those goal setting uh, with that goal setting component The graphic feedback condition was the first condition presented. And at the end of that two-week period, they would post a big bar graph of how's everyone doing? And they'd post it in two places in the home. It had different homes in the same group. So like homes one through five were group, you know, group A, the high performing group, and then six to, you know, um, I think it was like five, like six to ten was the second group. And you could see how well the four other people or in one group's case, the two other homes were doing in terms of handing in that seat. So there you go. You got, you got it posted where places everyone could see. I think it was like the, the break room, you know, was one place it was posted. 
And then after that condition, they added in a goal setting component where every month they'd meet with the supervisory staff. The, the researchers would meet with the supervisory staff and they sort of go over the results. And then the supervisory staff would deliver performance feedback and set a goal for the next month with the help of the researchers. They had these little line graphs that would show, here's where you were last period, and here is the trend. So they kind of show the trend, are you increasing, staying flat, decreasing? They'd present it to staff, they'd talk about how it was different than the last period, and then the supervisors at the residence would just make a goal that seemed reasonable. Was That, that, that was about it. They didn't get too technical about that. And obtainable. Again, the researchers would help them with that, but it, it wasn't a goal that the staff were able to set, possibly because there were 200 of them working at all sorts of different times. So it was like, we think this is a good goal for everybody. Let's, let's, you can do it. <laughs> so many people. Yeah. They'd also write down what the goal was and plans to achieve the goal, but they don't mention that in the article because they didn't measure it. So there are a lot of variables <laughs> that we're not controlled for here. <laughs> you know, we're working. It's at the beginning. Yes. We're at the beginning here. And then the supervisors would be notified, hey, your group met the goal, or hey, your group didn't meet the goal. And again, it, it really wasn't clear, and the researchers didn't know how many other techniques might have been used. Were staff getting more feedback? Did they have other little trainings? You know, were there other postings? Did, you know, did someone go out of their way to, like, make little graphs of performance that weren't the ones the researchers were doing? No idea. Seems unlikely. <laughs> I doubt that one. That last one's probably not likely, yeah. And then finally, the last condition was just a follow-up where the researchers actually trained some supervisory assistants to collect all the data and calculate the percentages. They, you know, they train them using a little TA and everything. And then they did two probes for each group, but without telling them, hey, here's, here's what we expect to see, or hey, we're coming in to see how you're doing with your goal. It's just, they just came see in and said, let's see, let's see how everyone's doing about three months like probe, after the fact. Probe. Yeah. Now, I must say this article had the shortest results section I've ever seen in my life. It was literally... I don't want to say literally because oh, I can't remember if it was exactly a paragraph, but it was about a paragraph. Figuratively. Yeah. It was. Uh, I, actually, it, might, might, I, it was an I'm going to err on literally a paragraph <laughs> in which they were like, here were the baseline scores. Group one to three, respectively, were at 43%, 26%, 28% would hand in those data sheets. Then they added graphic feedback. The means moved to 48%, 59%, 62%. Interesting that the lower performing houses actually did better. Our groups did better than the highest performing house. Then they added goal setting to the graphic feedback, and then the numbers went up 80%, 85%, and 84%. The follow-up probes were also high, 76, 82, 85. So graphic feedback plus goal setting equals results. Ta-da! There were some kind of interesting patterns, like group one, the high-performing group, was sort of flat during the graphic feedback and then showed an increasing trend with the goal setting. In group two was pretty consistent increase actually in the graphical feedback in the most of the houses. And again, they have all these graphs of different houses plus the mean across all the uh, all the houses in the group. One had an increase in baseline. So again, looking at some of the data, you know, you could find individual houses where you might say like, Ooh, run that baseline out longer because there's an increasing trend or run that graphic feedback session out a uh, condition out longer because there's an increasing trend. But I believe they were going by the houses overall. So they didn't really have that luxury of saying, well, we can keep running it for everybody because if three of the five houses were flatline in terms of their percentage of handing in data sheets, even though two of them kind of are showing an increasing trend. I think that they still moved on to the right. next condition. Well, because they were a group design, really. Yeah. Right. Like that's the difference between group design and mm -hmm. not group design. Yeah. Then the third group, they actually, again, had some increasing baseline for a couple of the houses. Some did okay with graphic. One did pretty good with graphical feedback. One really you didn't see any change until the goal setting was added. One quit because they had problems. They didn't mention what problems, but they couldn't keep going with the study. I guess a problem so bad that collecting data sheets just wasn't important anymore. Maybe it was like a pandemic. It was when swine flu came through and then all yeah, the maybe. staff got sick. So the researchers say goal setting plus graphic feedback successful. They, they mentioned that this behavior originally was resistant to change. Although by resistant to change, it just seems like they tried to do a lot of in-services and then punish people for not handing in their data sheet through disciplinary action. So I don't know if I would call that resistant to change right. exactly so much as a lot of ineffectual technique, a lot Proper of ineffectual procedures used. Yeah. In place. Yeah. Again, right. This is real life. Mm -hmm. Real life. Yeah. True story. Again, if you look at the aggregate data, it's the graphs are very clear. Like baseline low, graphic feedback kind of low, but a little better. Add goal oh. setting. Huge improvement. Again, some limitations. It took two years to do this study, but even with, I think they were talking like maybe 50 to 60% staff attrition, it was really high. They still were able to continue seeing these positive trends, which was great. 
However, how much training were staff getting in the data collection procedures? You know, they recommended it, but they didn't actually measure it. So again, some of this might have been a tra- you know training issue as well. It could have been resolved with stronger training procedures. Why did some of the houses show increases before they switched conditions? Nobody knows. Were there other consequences provided to staff? Each home, each home was kind of its own little autonomous house or residence. So who knows what other pieces might have been in play as well. They also don't know whether people continue to use these procedures after the researchers left. However, in follow-up, the results were still good. So you assume that they use these conditions, but hey, maybe they didn't. Maybe they just stopped doing anything at all, but enough staff stayed that sort of were just in the habit of handing in their data sheets at the end of the shift, right? Also, it was a really complex procedure to do. So they recommend if anyone were to do this again in this big an organization, probably want to divvy up the work a little bit better. It was like 20 to 30 hours of work per week for whichever researcher for two years. <laughs> and they're like, is this ever going to wow. be done? And then, you know, what's the cost benefit analysis of programs? Like, again, a lot of OBM questions there that can't be answered. And the quality of the data, who knows if it was any good, but those data sheets got handed in. So first step, you have to turn them in in order yep. to make sure they're good. Yep. And two years from now, you can go to step two. So that's one example. Let's turn to some other examples that are in way, uh, not more fun, but I think way more varied business settings like pizza parlors and Home Depots. <laughs> and laboratories. Oh, we're, we're in huts and depots, I think. We don't know exactly where we are, but yeah. So I have two studies that I'm going to review, which use goal setting in combination Mm -hmm. with some other things. So the first one is the Amigo et al. group in 2008. And they were looking at task clarification, goal setting, and feedback to decrease table busing in a quote-unquote high-volume pizza restaurant. Pizza Hut. Couldn't Pizza Hut? It was a sit-down restaurant, right? It's Pizza Hut. High-volume sit-down restaurant. That probably had slightly see-through maroon <laughs> water glasses. Right, is or my it could guess. be the Godfather pizza, depending on where they're at. Oh yeah, I didn't have that where I lived. What? Godfather pizza was in the south. Oh. And in the west, no, not where, not where I but was, but not in the north. Mm-hmm. Maybe in 2008, but not when I was a frequent sure I pizza look establishment. It it's probably Pizza Hut attendee. So the the issue here is that it's hard to keep high volume restaurants clean. There's a lot of competing contingencies going on for these poor servers who are so clearly much. overworked. So they wanted to look at this particular aspect of their job in this pizza restaurant. They had four female lunchtime servers who were their main participants and they were aged 18 to 24 and As they are, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One male manager who was aged 28. Everyone was paid $2.15 per hour, plus they had the opportunity to receive tips. Yep. That is expensive. Just kidding. I know, right? Ooh. And the way they did this is they divvied up the restaurant into four quadrants, and so each of the servers had their own quadrant to maintain. Now, the only, they wanted to look specifically at busing of the tables, which I guess is only spelled with one S, which seems wrong. But that's the way it was written in print. It's to differentiate from when people pretend to be buses and let people sit on their back while they sort of walk places with them. That's not a thing. No, it's not a thing. But what if it were? were, We don't actually know if they were doing the other parts of their job. But there were all other parts of their job, including waiting on the customers, bringing them their food, refilling their glasses, all of those pieces. But they were also responsible for busing the tables. Now, this varies restaurant to restaurant, right? Whether the servers have to also bus the tables, but at this particular hut-shaped restaurant, they did. And busing involved stacking the dishes, spraying the table, taking dishes back to the back, and then guess what else, guys? (laughs) They also had to wash the dishes. I don't... That seems like very inefficient. It does. Yeah, it really does. does. Don't you just get someone to wash the dishes? Like, isn't it usually a dishwasher? That's a position. Or yes. girl. I've never, yeah, ever like had to wash dishes as years a waitress. Old. Yeah. No, you need, right? you, need, you need to be 18. You got to run that big machine where you put them all in and you, you put the big rectangle oh, yeah. down over that? it. And it's like, shh. The only I liked in like, Ratatouille when they gave the rats a bath in that. Yeah. The only time I ever <laughs> saw that was when I was like volunteering at a church. And then I would like stay after to wash the donut nice. stuff. And I'd be like, mm. yes. <laughs> Here I Let go. Let me at that machine. I, was, I never worked in a restaurant when I was old enough to use it. I did, but I was a waitress. I was a waitress, and I definitely did not wash Same. my own dishes. 
And the authors were like, well, you can see how this is a problem because the more tables you bus, then the more dishes you have to wash. Mm -hmm. So it you know, makes sense behaviorally that you would delay bussing the tables because you're also trying to attend to your patrons who are the ones who are going to give you the tip. Yeah. Right. And that's where you make your money. So this reminded me completely, Rob, of the that video game where you have to make the sandwiches. Overcooked? Overcooked. Oh, geez, yes. yeah. Hopefully that, that, our listeners know. That is literally too many jobs and not enough people the game. Yes. You're a little You're constantly min-maxing. Ma- cook the meat and make the burgers and take them to the window. And, and everyone's got a job dishes. to start. Everyone's like, all right, you're cutting the vegetables and you're mm-hmm. cooking the meat and you're washing the dishes. But then invariably... You don't have enough people to do all the tasks and it gets very complicated. Sometimes you're on a pirate ship. It's very hard. And it's so stressful and I'm so bad at it. And this totally reminded me of it. They also just, as an aside, let us know that while the other parts of their job were defined in the job manual, busing was not even mentioned in there as part of their job responsibilities. So they're like, this is a problem. Everyone is not busing the tables. So they used an ABC design. (laughs) <laughs> which is an mm. awesome design okay ABC. Uh, they did a baseline lasted for four weeks where they just looked to see was anyone busting the tables and then in condition b they added in this task clarification memo and goal setting so the task clarification was they passed out detailed instructions on how to bus a table since it wasn't included in the manual it was basically what i just said and then at the at the same time, they also set a goal to have each table bust in three minutes or less. Or your pizza was free? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. The employees had to sign off on the memo. This condition lasted for two weeks. And then after that, they moved to condition C, which was individual verbal and group graphic feedback. So the Ooh. manager would deliver individual feedback weekly it was not meant to be punitive. They were just reminded of the goal and then shown a graph of their average busing time for the week. Oh, I'm sorry. This was individual graphic feedback. My bad. And then the manager gave suggestions on reducing busing time. I hope that these conversations went well, but I also feel like they did I not. would have been very annoyed if my manager was like, look how easy it would be for you to just bust this table quicker. Just do your rest of your job quicker. And then you're quicker. Mm-hmm. But maybe it wasn't like that. That's some good feedback. I know. Thank you. <laughs> and then they also... I have a piece of paper to write that down. <laughs> Although they said an ABC design, they also kind of had this D condition, which was the follow-up condition where they gave only weekly group feedback that was posted and showed the average busing time across all servers. But if you were the best busser, then you you got your name on the wall. So there was a little bit of like maybe positive reinforcement built in there. At least it was clear how you got your name on the wall. Could have been worse. Yeah. yeah so. so there were three things that they were measuring. The total busing time, so start to finish. The time it took to get to the table, like a latency measure. And the time to finish busing the table. And then they had graphs for each of those things. Okay. So the average busing time total in baseline was 314 seconds. But they did have something of a decreasing trend across this condition. So mm. to me, that seems like there were probably some reactivity effects to the observers being present or something. In the clarification and goal setting condition, this busing time reduced to 283 seconds. And then when they added in the feedback condition, this bumped all the way down to 151 seconds. So that was dramatically better. And then when they moved to the weekly follow-up, it was back up to 275. For the meantime, to get to the table, it was 133 seconds in baseline, 69 seconds in task clarification goal setting, and 62 seconds in feedback. We didn't get follow-up data on that. And then the time to finish busting the table was 181 seconds in baseline, 214 seconds it went up, in clarification goal setting and 88 seconds in feedback. So that was effective for that. So the results were like, I felt like a little bit all over. Mm. Oh yeah, 100%. They were. here. You did see reductions in the busing time during the feedback condition specifically and a little bit of a decrease in the goal setting, but not as much as it was in the feedback. And then the time to table 
reduced in both the goal setting and the feedback condition. So that one was the one where we, they saw maybe an immediate effect with the goal setting. That seems so odd, though, because you would think that the mean, like, once you get to the table, wouldn't you just bust the table? Like, it seemed like the limiting factor would be it's taking everyone forever to start busing. But once you start busing, were people stopping, you know, mid bus? Were they like chatting on the way? Were, I mean, maybe. You never know. Yeah, they don't say. Were they, I mean, maybe. Would they get distracted? Like they take some stuff and they'd be more willing to listen to, you know, to tell customers like, oh, I'll get that right away rather than like, oh, just give me one moment and then they'd finish busing and then go get the water that they got asked for as they were walking by a table. You know, because you know how it is when you're when you're yeah. a waiter or a waitress, yeah. you're constantly getting called over for things. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that, that's it's, it's odd. It seems like once you got that mean time to, to, to table down, it should all fallen into place. And that was not the result. I agree. And it's unclear. It was a lot of variation in the responding, really. Uh, they also measured what they called pre-busing, which is like starting to remove things from the table while the customers are still there. Yanking things out of their hands. Which I don't, I mean, I don't think of that as bad, personally. If some, sometimes servers will come over and say, oh, are you finished with that? And they'll, yeah. you know, kind of clear, help clear the table so there's more room. And I, they didn't consider it a bad thing either. Oh. That they did see an increase in that. We didn't get hard data on it. And then they also were looking at what's called cross busing, which is where they a server might go bus a table in another section. And they had explained to them ahead of time that that was also fine and they could do that. Those data are included in the data that we have here. And that increased as well. So there's more busing happening. But I would not necessarily consider it to be particularly tightly controlled mm. by the independent variables that we were examining <laughs> on a surface then, level i would see that as a sign that like oh they, they, they must be working towards a goal because you know you don't have to cross bus it's not technically your responsibility right. so why would you do it i mean a lot of reasons but sure part of it could be so that they could reach the goal or that the, 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 to yeah maybe could be could be so you know how i mentioned before it was an abc Oh yeah, design, what happened to the? Which is like a little bit questionable. So it's not the actual. That's not a right. design. So right? they it's said like, at the end, oh, it was supposed to be an A B C A design. We were supposed to have a return to baseline, but we couldn't because all the participants quit. <laughs> so in that, if, in, in that, re- in that regard, would you say the goal setting and uh, graphic feedback was a failure because it didn't make anyone want to stay in their job? I Latency went that. up to infinity. This is a really good one. Like, if there's some professors out here that want to look at experimental design, give this to your students and ask them if this is a fu- this demonstrates a functional relation because it doesn't, right? But they'll see ABC and they'll be like, if mm-hmm. they don't know, they'll be like, yeah, sure, right? There, yeah. I mean, it does have that follow up on the end, but mm-hmm. they kept the feedback in place. It was just modified, so they ne- they do never return to baseline because they couldn't. Nope. Right. Because everyone no said, take this job. And serve it. I just love that. <laughs> I know. When I got to there, I was like, oh, my God. It felt so bad for all of the participants the whole time. Mm-hmm. They're asking a lot. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of these people. And I really felt for them. And so I was kind of glad when I Everybody got quit at the same time, though. Something must have something must have happened there. Maybe it was like a... I don't know. It could have been it. like a college town and everyone cleared out. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, well, that manager was 28, though. He's going back to college. He's in grad school. He got transferred. He's so moving up. He moving got transferred up. to a different Pizza Hut. <laughs> oh, they would have mentioned that he got him. He was promoted <laughs> because of the results of his graphic feedback and goal setting managerial Actually, style. Actually, you know what I bet? I bet he went to go work at this Home Depot. <laughs> oh, yeah, just moved right over. <laughs> That's the other study that I'm going to talk about yes. now. Uh, this is Louie and Bailey, 2007. And so here, once again, we're going to take a look at some package components of graphic feedback, goal setting, and manager praise on customer service behaviors happening specifically in a national retail store for home improvement supplies. There it is. So that sounds a lot like a Home Depot. Could have been Lowe's. Yep, that's true. true. You know, but we we don't know for sure. Back in 2007, I feel like it's probably a, a Home Depot. So they start out by telling us things like it's hard to measure customer service behaviors because they can be a little tricky to operationally define versus something like cleaning. They specifically point out, (laughs) see study above. This study actually was published first, though. And they said, how should we actually define good customer service? There was an article by Winstead in 2000 that took a look at surveys of customer satisfaction and which 
behaviors of uh, the retail workers that the customers rated as occurring the most. So they did a correlation across that and they found that the behaviors that were most correlated with customer satisfaction were greetings, making eye contact and smiling. So Winstead Mm. considered these three to be like the core good customer service that people are looking for. So the current study wanted to increase these behaviors as a partial replication of a previous study, which we didn't review for today, called Eichenhout and Austin 2004. But they wanted to do it in this Home Depot setting. So they actually had two stores. There were a lot of participants in this study, too. Rob, this one. <laughs> Rob. Sorry. Just geez. want to point out that this study had 300 employees. Wow. 150 in each store. All that seemed to occur here is that the employees were told that someone would be observing them. Is that it? Yeah. That's all that they needed for Reac- consent? Reactivity. That's their oh. job. It's their job. OBM is their job. Right? It seemed weird. Yeah, but it's their job. Mm. But yes, I agree. Uh, IRB right now, today, I, today's IRB wouldn't take that. Mm. Mm. Right? Ours would. So, so the other like, oh yeah, some people might be around observing you. That's all the news that they got beforehand. And the dependent variable that they were measuring, they were the three things I just mentioned, but then they went further into the operational definitions, which I did appreciate. So it was greeting customers, which could be as brief as, hi, how are you today? But not just hi. Making eye contact with customers. And this was defined as the face of the employee was oriented toward the customer. So they didn't try to actually determine if eye contact between the two was made, it was more like orientation toward. And then smiling at customers, which was defined as mouth upturned, teeth not required. <laughs> I like that though, right? You I don't like have to too. be like creepy like, I know. Hi, Hi, how are you? Here are my teeth. No, I liked it too, but I, I appreciated that they went ahead and gave us their definitions. Mm-hmm. They did their observations as unobtrusively as possible, but it seems likely that they were still visible to the employees. Well, they wore yeah. their lab coats like fools. <laughs> but, you know, it was a busy store. Where people are milling about. So maybe it wasn't, you know, quite as obvious as I'm thinking. They were stationed at the front of the store and at high traffic areas. And they did separate the data out front versus back in the data. But I'm not going to go into those details because they were almost identical. And the observations lasted for 30 minutes or until 20 potential interactions occurred. So 20 people walked by. Okay. The design was an A, B, C design. Uh, <laughs> but we had yes. two settings okay. here. So A, B, C. I know. Right? It was a multiple design. baseline across settings. That's, that's the difference. The baseline for store A was 45 days. The baseline for store B was less than that, but it started later than the original baseline. So then they just like shoved it over kind of so that it functioned as a multiple baseline, it like looked, a staggered baseline, but it was but kind it of funky. Yeah. But they were varied lengths of time. And I think they were trying to get a concurrent measure as what was happening there. So in baseline, nothing was in place. In condition B it was the graphic feedback <laughs> condition here. Group scores of how well the group was doing on greetings or customer service sorry all of those behaviors combined were posted two times a week in the break room no individual data were presented there were four graphs total so they 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 did break it down greetings eye contact i like that yep and then the c condition was when they added in goal setting so at least in this study you have the separation of graphic feedback and goal setting right so we get a little bit of separation there as far as teasing apart the ivs yeah so C was the package of goal setting, graphic feedback, and manager praise. So here they took the same graphs. They just added a red dash line of what the goal was for the graph. And they set the goal 20% higher than the highest level of the previous phase. Let everybody know at morning meeting, if you met the goal twice, even non-consecutively, a new goal was set. And managers were trained in these behaviors to know when, to know when someone is smiling. And to provide individual praise if they observe these things happening. There wasn't a whole lot of like procedural integrity surrounding that. They were just like, yeah, we trained them and then they did it. So results for this initial baseline results were low and variable around like 15 to 20 percent. 
Except for this one time when the manager was present. I love that. And then it, the data points are hugely Ooh. high. It's up to 60%. So there you go. They figured out what they need to do for their treatment. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I think 60% was higher than a lot, some of the treatment days. Oh, it definitely was. Yeah. Nothing ever was as high as that. The feedback condition alone just showed slightly higher and variable responding. And then when they added in the goal setting package treatment, Store one did not ever meet their goal. Store two did, but the responding was still pretty variable. And that was pretty much true for that. That pattern I just described was pretty much true for greetings and for eye contact. Smiling was a tiny bit better. Like People started smiling a little bit more, but it still wasn't that great, mm. yeah. to be quite honest with you. So there's a lot of potential limitations here, which the authors were readily willing to share with us. There was not a lot of feedback that was given to them. Probably the group was too large. They should have collected more data. They don't really know if praise was an effective reinforcer, etc. But they tried and it was a start. Can you imagine if someone came up to you, your supervisor came up and said, hey, great job smiling at that customer. (laughs) I like praise. I don't think I would appreciate being told that. Well, hey, that's your great job. job smiling. I would just smile all the time so that no one... Oh, no, that wouldn't work. I guess I would not smile yeah. so that no one would come up to me to be like, great job smiling. Right. Yeah. Just be like this. No, yeah. No smile. Like, as as, as we all learned at, at one of the last book clubs, nobody likes being told you should smile more. No. Yeah, we did learn that. We did learn that. It was a hard no. Okay. All right. All right. Well, now that we've talked about some research where goal setting has been effective, somewhere it might not have been as effective, let's drill down into goals themselves. You talked a lot about what what's a good goal? What should we set a goal? Jackie, tell us about difficult and very difficult goals. I love this. So the Russo Williams article is long. Just a precursor. It is a long article. But if you skim the introduction and get right into it, it's a little more manageable. Well, either read the intro or read the discussion because they kind of start the talking about right. the same Read things. the intro. So here, the purpose of the study was to assign difficult goals and very difficult goals and look at the different, the, looking at both of those goals as well as different types of feedback and measuring where the persistence in performance, incorrect and correct responding, as well as how high performance or not would go over baseline levels. And so they had 24 participants. They were all undergraduates and they were getting credit for their class. Two and a half hours of credit, one might say. And they made a realistic data entry task using Visual Basic, which I know how to do. So I could do this. Rock on. Yeah. And so they made it look realistic. And the task required a keyboard and a mouse. And at most, the study took about 150 minutes to complete, right? So participants were entering fake ECG data. And this has been used used in multiple studies. So they needed to enter medical information, like look down, enter it. They show you in the article what it would look like, Mm -hmm. right? So that's what they were looking at. The dependent variable was the correct and incorrect responses. Then they calculated a percentage from the raw data. They also added a start over button where participants could click the start over button at any time and it would restart your session if you weren't making your goal for whatever reason. Right? That's how they measured persistence by how many times people hit the start over button. And the independent variable where the goals were set at, this is incredible. 150% of baseline. Wow. And 175% of baseline. Hmm. That's a lot. That's a very difficult goal. Right? It's, it is, unless you did like four in baseline and now your goal's seven. Right. That's not what happened. <laughs> oh, really but oh, you know, just because you do bad doesn't mean a very difficult goal is any easier. Right. But anyway. This so, is reminding me of uh, Rob playing rock band and how many times you would hit the start over button if you weren't a. Oh. Perfect. Okay, the achievement was hit all of the notes <laughs> in the Beatles' Start Dig over. a Pony. Start over. Start over. Which I almost did a million times, but I get to the last part, you have to do a little trill, you go, and I always like blow it, like yeah. right on the last one. So if that song's three and a half minutes long, then I've listened to three and a half well, the million only, minutes. Times. The only parts of Dig a Pony you know are, blue, ba doo ba doo ba oh, no, okay. start again. Okay, okay I'm bringing sorry. it back. I'm sorry. And so within the difficult and very difficult goals, they also had two feedback conditions. That was shown on the bottom of the screen. So feedback one just showed the percent of goal completion. Like if you had 10 responses out of 100, it would be show 10%. 
Feedback two, compared the progress of you to what it should be if you were going to finish the lesson, right? So it showed you your percent completed, but then it also like highlighted green if you were on track to receive your, right, make your goal, or it highlighted red if you weren't, right? So that's analogous to some less than analogy that they talked about a lot, but I don't really think it matters here. And then they also provided a choice condition. It's relational the frame theory related. Right. To Not, yeah, we'll get, we don't need to get there. It's besides this, it's besides the point here. And so then they also had a choice condition on the last condition to see which feedback condition participants preferred, right? So first the experimenter walked participants through the task while doing it, walk, like talking about it. Participants had to walk themselves through it while talking about it. Then they were asked to complete it while the experimenter watched, and then they were given five minutes to do it. So they really knew how to do the task when baseline started. Baseline and the control condition were the same thing. Even though they put them out, they're like, it looks exactly at a baseline. I was like, this is the same. <laughs> so they were given 13 minutes, told to do your best, and then just correct responses ran across the bottom of the screen, right? No feedback was given. Baseline, done. I would love to do Great. this. I love data entry. Gross. I would hate this. So, I want to be in it so bad. Okay, well, then I'll call them and tell them <laughs> if they do it again to invite you. Then they had feedback one. Condition where eight participants were in the 150% of the goal condition and eight participants were in the 175% goal condition. The experimenters explained what each of the participants' baseline level was and what their current goal was based on, you know, the difficult or very difficult condition that they're in. Explain that they would see the total percentage towards their goal and explain the start over button, right? So they can always do that. Then at the end, they answered yes, no questions about goal commitment, <laughs> ranging from I am committed to this goal versus I, they said, I frankly don't care about this goal at all. Yeah. So by the way, this spoiler alert, they saw nothing. It was like 3.67 out of five. No, it wasn't. They're undergraduates. There's some reactivity happening. Yeah. Nobody cares about this. Yeah. Right? Frankly. Frankly, nobody cares. <laughs> Even though they didn't put that, nobody cares. Okay. So then at the end of the session, they showed the total score. Feedback two condition was the exact same, but you're going to see those two boxes, right? Green, red, that's it. And then finally, there was a choice condition where participants were asked which choice condition they wanted to work under in their final session. So the max time was two and a half hours due to the start over button and participants could take a break whenever they wanted. Right. Yeah. So basically what they found is that when they looked at what condition they preferred, feedback one or feedback two, it was split down the middle for the 150% condition. And then they were very specific. Six participants shows what they experienced just recently and two reverted back because they counterbalanced <laughs> it. So they just wanted to make sure. And then the average percentage over baseline for that feedback, feedback one condition was 159%. In the 150% baseline and 163% for this feedback, too. So that's pretty crazy. Yeah. And this is even more crazy. Undergraduates actually use the start over button. Mm. Five out of eight of them did. Mm. Crazy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. 24 times in feedback one, 17 times in feedback two. One of them increased it by 50 minutes. They might wow. have cared. But I don't know why. The authors were <laughs> also in the discussion were like, what? Mm -hmm. But anyway. Because you want to beat it. Right. I know. You want to beat it. Yes. It's like a game. It's like a game, right? But this is not the game I, kind of game I want to play. Mm. But anyway, in the 175% feedback condition, four of them chose feedback one, three of them chose feedback two, and one person quit. <laughs> Because they said that it was too, too hard. hard. Yeah. I'm not going to make my goal. So I'm out of here. They had like right? an existential crisis in the comments. Like, I just keep making mistakes. I can't yeah, seem cool. to do it. They seem right. very, mm -hmm. very upset about well, the Well, it was a very difficult goal. And you can see it when you look at the average it was percentage. A VDG. Literally, it yeah. was a very difficult goal. So the average percentage over baseline was only 135% and 143% for feedback one and two, respectively. And what they found is that. When they talk to participants in the 175%, that most of them just created their own goal to beat because mm. it was too hard. And only one participant met the 175% goal in the third session. Mm. So that was really hard, right? And we saw that one participant quit because yeah. they were like, screw this. 
And the last thing I think to talk about is that accuracy increased in both the control, which is the no goal condition, and the 150% of baseline condition, but decreased to 80-ish percent in the 175% condition. So take home points. We wrapped it in. Is that very difficult goals? If they're very, very difficult, right? People get frustrated, they quit, they underperform, and they make errors. Yeah. So, but if it is a difficult goal, you see higher levels of performance, more consistent, correct responding, and less emotional responding, right? People used the start over button, which is crazy. So they measured persistence. They saw it was a little bit more in feedback too, but again, that's not going to be helpful for us in real life, right? And goal commitment didn't matter here. Like, come on. Come on, researchers. I think that we need to look at that in a different way or make it so it matters. Because, again, this was in the laboratory. I feel like this is kind of like when the expectation was that we would finish our doctoral degrees in three years right. while working full time. Yep. And everyone's just like, ah, right. that's not happening. Not happening. I'm making my own goal. <laughs> I'm setting right. my own goal. Yes, exactly. So anyway, that is our, you know, wrap up of goal setting. It's we got some mixed results. But again, I think the take home point without being in dissemination statement station is that these were done in real life situations with people that have different histories of reinforcement related to goals, different histories related to reinforcers. So, so you're just going to wrap up. We're not going to go to dissemination station. No, we'll get there. But Let's it's just, just promising. It. Here we go. He's going by. There we go. Okay. We no. We missed it we for the first time in five years. <laughs> no, we can't. For, we, that's a part of the show. We have to do it. All right. So we got goals. <laughs> Jack, you already started kind of wrapping up in terms of looking at goal setting across, yeah. you know, it was nice. I think it's nice to have articles that are going to look at goal setting across all of these different locations. We learned that goal setting is very effective, though, again, typically it's paired with something else, That's whether it's the, the performance feedback, it's whether it's a package. Yeah, with some sort of feedback usually goes along with goal setting. And then it even seemed in the research we looked at, it was a little inconsistent as to whether goal setting was added and improved graphical feedback. So like in the in the direct care staff study versus the, the pizza parlor study where feedback came in. I mean, the goal setting was earlier with task clarification. The effects weren't really seen until the feedback component was added. So you can't even say like, well, it's usually goal, you know, goal setting. When you add feedback, it works better because sometimes it's you have feedback and you add goal setting and things get better. Yeah. But to, it's like a Reese's peanut butter cup. You got to have both. To or it's not it, that good. How do you do goal setting without talking about feedback? Right. You can't. You're like, you could set a goal and then I'll just never tell you if you met it. Well, then, mm-hmm. right. Then it's not. What's the then, point? Right. Then it can't be when well, we're talking about the four term contingency in order for a goal to then serve as that discriminative stimuli, that behavior must be reinforced. So you, you can't really have the goal without the reinforcement, mm-hmm. I'm saying. But you could do feedback in ways that I think are slightly different than what we think of as effective feedback. You know, it could be someone takes their own data. Maybe it's not, you know, is that as effective? I mean, I guess it was in you, the sense of the, the the lab study where, I mean, they weren't taking their own data, but the computer was telling them. Right, but they're they not doing. taking their own data because the problem with taking your own data, right, is that providing your own reinforcement and you can ask that, that reinforcement anytime, which is why Starbucks is not an effective reinforcer for me anymore. <laughs> right? Because I can just show up there and be like, I deserved this. Yeah. So if you want to use goals, you have to, you know, define the goals. You're going to be pairing them with other forms of feedback. If you make them too hard, then your staff will probably actually, you know, not show the same levels of improvement as if you make a difficult but more achievable goal. So that 150%, I don't know if that's a magic number, but might be a place to to look at to start. Also, and this came up in a couple of the a couple of the papers, if you're going to set goals, you have to make sure that you're doing it within a small enough group because it did seem that the larger the group the less effective the goals were. And that might be like, well, yeah, but the one study, the Gill study had 200 people, but that was spread across multiple houses where there were like 10 to 14 people per house. So even though they were using goal setting across the whole organization, the goals were only related to a small number of people. It wasn't all 200 people at the exact same time, like in the Home Depot study. Sure. So if you're doing an interdependent group contingency in which it's just the average across people that's going to make the goal be met, which was the case in these studies, and you can have stragglers who aren't meeting the goal and who are going to continue to expect the overachievers in the group to pull up the average, and Mm -hmm. that's probably what's happening in the the big groups. Yeah. 
It sounded smart. I'm yeah. done. Why does goal setting work? Oh, I don't know. A lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Could be any of them. But I guess more research is needed in this I'd like area, to right? see a study where they look at if you set the goal yourself versus if someone sets it for you. Well, there has, I mean, I know in, in the, the kind of the introductory article, it did appear that choice was maybe preferred, but it the results weren't so strong. I guess I want more data then. Yes. You want actual, you want like a more current research. Yeah. yeah. To yeah. the now people. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because there's a lot of factors mm-hmm. at play here and things are not like they were in 1984. I'd like a little bit more guidance as to which goals should be set. Or like, how would you determine what goals mm-hmm. are the most appropriate? So a little bit beyond, you know, do, let the people choose their own goals so much as what are the goals that you should be targeting? And that, and that might not be related directly to goals and how they work. But, you know, I like smiling. Smiling's my favorite. Yeah. But it, you, you might want to have a sense of like, well, what are the goals that would be effective? Are there goals that will never be effective because the behavior you're looking to increase is for whatever reason, it's not. Well, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not sensitive to well, goal other setting. Competing contingencies that may prevent it from mm-hmm. really changing. Uh, that's true. If you set, yeah, if you set a goal for a behavior that has a lot of competing, re- you know, the, the, the competing behaviors gets more reinforcement. Is the goal still going to be effective? Is it going to change behavior that way? No. Well, you would think no. I mean, we didn't really look at any studies that directly no you're controlled right. for it's that. It's an open question. All right. We did it. Thank you. That's a lot about goals. Hey, goals, goals. So use goals. Or not. But well, make you, sure that you think about them. You probably should use goals. They seem pretty great. There's a thousand studies about goals leading all the way back to the days of the Telegraph. 1897. <laughs> all right. Well, before we wrap up, I want to make sure to do our second secret code word. It is rebellion. R-E-B-E-L-L-I-O-N. Like in Star Wars, the rebellion fights the empire. It's not at all what I was thinking. What were you thinking? I don't know what's up there on a on a game. Where? I don't know, but I saw it because obviously that's not a word I would come up with. Oh, so. Age of, that's a Star Wars. It's okay. a Star Wars game. Oh, okay, like I'm like don't have any idea. The only time anyone talks about rebellion is is in in response to Star Wars, I believe. There's no other other than rebellion. That's the one that matters. <laughs> the fake one. All right, rebellion. Well, thank you all so much for listening to ABA Inside Track. We hope you enjoyed our show. We'd really love it if you subscribed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher. We also can be found at a lot of other places. If you'd like to reach out, we're on all the socials as ABA Inside Track. You can find these episodes posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature. If you go to abainsidetrack.com, you can find these episodes plus all of the articles, links to all of the articles discussed, as well as a place to purchase CEs and all of our old episodes, over 180, jeez, 186. This is 186, a whole lot of episodes, plus some fun bonus episodes as well. That's ABA Inside Track. Dot com. And if you want even more ABA Inside Track, why not join us on Patreon? Patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where we have updated our goals for the new year. The new year being 2021. I guess it goes into 2022 as well. But yes, we have some updated tiers. We have some updated rewards, including more live events, live Q&As, those fabulous two-hour book clubs, CE discounts, and some special exclusive merch, which I'm sure you don't want to miss. So, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. Join us, won't you? Well, Jackie and Diana, that's all the time we have until our next week. Last but not least, thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for his interstitial music, Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his editing work, and Hollis Irvin from Sycamore Workshop for his visual designs. We'll be back next week with another episode, but until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye! Bye.